Thank you, choir. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see everyone out tonight. If you're joining us on social media or if you're watching our broadcast at a later date, stay tuned. I'm sure you'll get a blessing tonight. We're going to start off in the anthem songbook tonight with number 333. Number 333, He Lives.
Amen. Thank you for your good singing. He lives. We serve a risen Savior. Amen? All right. At this time, we're going to bow in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight that we do serve a risen Savior, Lord. And we know that if we accept you as our personal Savior, you live within our hearts. Lord, we pray that each and every one will know this truth tonight, Lord, and they will accept you before it's forever too late so that you could live within them. Lord, our prayer is that they will know you tonight before the time comes to a close. Lord, we pray for so many that are sick tonight. Lord, if we name names, we're going to forget so many. But Lord, we thank you that you are a God that knows each and every one of them. You know their need at this time, Lord, and you're always with your people. And we give you thanks for this, Lord. We just pray for this service as it goes forth tonight. We pray for our brother Craig as he brings the word. Lord, our prayer is once again that if there's anyone in this service that doesn't know you or that might be listening out through social media or on a broadcast, Lord, that they will hear the word tonight and accept you before it's too late. Lord, we just pray that we who are believing people will also learn from your word tonight that we will live our lives a, a more a better example for you each and every day. We ask these things, giving you the thanks and the praise. In your name's sake, amen. amen. At this time, we're going to be favored with a solo, He Grew the Tree, followed by Firm Foundation, Redeemed. small lonely hill that he knew would be called Calvary. Then he planted a seed that would grow
Seems like all I could see was the struggle Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this gonna Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight, it's already been won. I am redeemed, I am redeemed, you set me free, so I'll shake off these heavy chains. And wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed I'm redeemed All my life I have been called unworthy by the voice of my shame and regret but when I hear you whisper child lift up your head I remember oh God you're not done with me these heavy chains then wipe away every sting now I'm not who I used to be because I don't have to be the old man inside of me cause his day is long dead and gone because I've got a new name a new life I'm not the same and a hope that will carry me home set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every sting now I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed I am redeemed you set me free I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every sting. No, I'm not who I used to be. Thank God I'm not who I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. Cause I am redeemed. Thank God redeemed. Thank you, Loxley, also Firm Foundation. We are going to turn to number 439. Number 439. And we are also going to sing Redeemed. But a different one, different song altogether, but with the same title. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Number 439.
At this time, the choir is coming with their last selection, You Are My King. You were condemned. I will love. 
my privilege to call on our brother Craig Shikard for the message tonight. Come on up, brother. Good evening. It's a pleasure for us to be here. Our scripture reading is going to be from John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we'll read a number of verses. This is an account of what is known as the woman by the well. John chapter 4, we'll read about the woman by the well. And we're going to start reading in verse 4. But he, that is the Lord Jesus, needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied, wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That would be, according to John's timing, midday. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now look down at verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now in verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And now verse 39, after the men came to him, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two, day, two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Now they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Well, we'll stop our scripture reading there, and obviously this whole account centers around this matter of water and thirst, and understanding that will be the key to understanding what's happening in this chapter. Uh, thirst is not that mysterious to us. We know it well. Um, it's your body's way of saying you need something. Um, you are thirsty and you need that thirst to be satisfied. So water then is a picture of what satisfies our thirst. Now, it's a picture of what satisfies our thirst, but it's a little bit of a poor picture because water only satisfies our thirst temporarily. And that also is going to come up in this account. 
and that is that the woman, even though she would drink water, she would thirst later on. But this story then is how a woman comes to find lasting satisfaction through the gift that the Lord Jesus has. So to understand what happens in this story, we have to think about what this woman did time and time and time again. That is, she would get thirsty. Fine, normal. She would then try to satisfy that thirst. She would go to this well. She would work hard, I take it, draw the water. She would then drink of the water and be satisfied for a while. Then the satisfaction would disappear. Maybe to be the next day then, she finds herself lacking again. And she would then be thirsty. She would go to the well. She would work. She would get the water. She would drink the water. It would satisfy for a while. And she found herself, perhaps as normal then, going time and time again to the well. Now, we know that that happens in the story. And then later in the story, the Lord turns the conversation to spiritual things. And part of the way he does this is he asks her to go call her husband. And she says, well, I, I, I don't have a husband. Uh, and of course, she has a bit of a sketchy history. We don't know what happened to all of these husbands. I take it that they didn't simply die and she got remarried to have five of them and on a uh, knowing a sixth man that seems very unlikely it seems what happened is she sought satisfaction in life through marrying a man and found it didn't permanently satisfy now think about what happened with the water Physically, she would get thirsty for water. She would go to the well. She would drink. It would satisfy her for a time, only for her to have to repeat the cycle again and again and again. And what happened in her life? In her life now, she found herself wanting. She found herself, well, we'll call it thirsty in that sense, and that is for satisfaction in life. And she sought to find it in a man and she got married. Again, we don't, realize, we don't read all the details as to exactly what happened, but somehow what she thought would satisfy her, and no doubt on her wedding day, she was very satisfied, this is it. Somehow it ran out. She found herself lacking that life satisfaction she was looking for. And just as she had to repeat this cycle again and again, getting water to drink to satisfy her thirst, she found herself repeating the cycle of finding a man, being satisfied, only to find out in time that the satisfaction ran out. So her life was bearing out the same thing as searching for water at the well. The same story is true today, by the way. I mean, it's normal that we all are seeking for some satisfaction in life. We don't want to go through life always wanting, always looking around the next corner for something, always saying, if only I had the next thing, I'd be satisfied. But so many of us find ourselves in the same situation as this woman in one way or another. That is, the thing that we thought would satisfy, we get in time and eventually find out it only satisfied temporarily. Uh, one famous soccer star said the following, the greatest thrill of my life was when I first scored the decisive goal in a big game and heard the roar of the cheering crowds. But in the quiet of my room that same night, a sense of futility swept over me. After all, what was it worth? Was there nothing better to live for than to score goals? Such thoughts, he said, were the beginning of my search for satisfaction. 
I knew in my heart that no one could meet my need but God himself. Soon after, I found Christ, and I found in him what I could never find in the world. This not only happened to this soccer star, we're finding out in what we're reading, it happened to this woman. And it's happened to countless people besides, many of whom are in this room. If you ask any of the true Christians in this room, and I'm not talking about somebody that wears the banner of Christian, but they're, they don't really have Christ truly inside. But I mean, the, the real Christians, what satisfies them? They'll, they'll tell you immediately that it's the Lord Jesus. He is the one that gives that complete and permanent satisfaction. If we look down in verse 13, the Lord says, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So the lesson is we should come to the Lord Jesus and drink. Now, how do we drink of the Lord Jesus? That, that's certainly symbolic. It's a figure, right? I mean, we don't literally drink. Well, yes, it is symbolic, but it's not so far removed from what we really do. Uh, a few pages back in the book of John, we read this. It's in John 1.12, and it says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So, yes, we come to the Lord, and according to this figure of speech, we drink of him. But you say, well, that's a figure of speech. What do we really do? Well, what we really do is we receive him. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. And this verse is saying that it's, it's a, an, an equivalent thing receiving him and allowing him to come into our life and give us new life is one and the same with believing on him because that's what it says at the end of the verse that is we are believing on him we are relying on him to come into our lives and give us that new life and that lasting and permanent satisfaction we receive him we rely on him or believe on him and these go hand in hand. So if you've heard that in order to be saved, you are to receive the Lord Jesus, and if you've heard that in order to be saved, you are to believe on the Lord Jesus, where well, they're both true, and you don't even have to do two things, because they are hand in hand, one and the same. Now, there are people that I've talked to, and they have believed and, and told me that as long as you have the right understanding of the Lord Jesus, you're saved. So if you know, these people who say, well, well Jesus was, was not God in the flesh, or Jesus was not the Christ, the Messiah, or, or Jesus was only maybe a good man or a, maybe just a historical figure, it, and they say, these are the bad people. They, they, they haven't really appreciated who Jesus is. But if you're one who really knows who Jesus is, that he is what the Bible calls the Son of God, he is God manifest in the flesh, then you're saved. If you, if you really appreciate and know who he is, you're one of the good ones and you're saved. Is that true? Is that all that is necessary, that we mentally know who he is? And the answer is no, there is something else to do besides knowing who he is. And you find that in verse 10 that we read. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and now look at it, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So let's try that again in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who I am, in other words, if you knew who it is who's saying to you, give me a drink, 
Does he then say you would be saved? Does he say if you knew who I am, you would be saved? He doesn't say that. He says if you knew who I am, you would then do something. And that do the something is you would have asked him or, or me, and he would have given you living water, which you would have then consumed, taken in. Again, the scripture says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. It is not simply to those who appreciate who he is. You can appreciate who he is, and he could still be outside here. He has to be, he has to be inside. If you knew who it is who asked you, you would have then asked of him. Well, there's good news in this chapter, by the way. She does get saved. She finds eternal satisfaction. She finds eternal life. And she is going to be, by the end of the chapter, a truly saved person. Now, we see this uh, if you look down in verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city. So she abandons the whole reason she came to the well in the first place. I take it this is clearly symbolic. She left her water pot. Why? Because she had found the greater satisfaction. She did not need it anymore. Now, in real life, people who are saved still need to physically drink to satisfy their physical needs, and this is fine and part of God's plan. Doesn't mean we get saved and we don't go need physical water anymore. But in this account, her leaving her water pot for which she got physical water and physical satisfaction was a picture indicating to us that she had found spiritual satisfaction in the Lord Jesus. And now she can go to the men of the city and spread good news to them too. Now, in her finding who the Lord Jesus was and receiving him, if you'll notice in the chapter, there are a series of steps that she takes in figuring out who he is. The first one we're going to see is in verse 9. In the middle of verse 9, she says, how is it that you being a Jew? Now, at this point in their conversation, she knows very little about him, but she can tell, there are various ways of dress that she would be able to tell, that he was a Jew. So she recognizes him as a Jew. Well, later then in the account in verse 19, she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now this is, this is moving a step ahead in the spiritual direction. He's not just any man or a Jew, he is a, a prophet. Well, as they converse more, she starts finding out, he, this is maybe even deeper than I realized. Verse 15, she says, I know that Messiah is coming, and I have no doubt that she brought this up because she suspected that perhaps she was talking to him. And in verse 26, the Lord says, I who speak to you am he. So she moves from Jew to prophet to Messiah. And then in the words of the men of the city at the end of verse 42, now we know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. She finds him and many others did as the savior and the savior of the world. So it may be that you're here and you've heard about the Lord Jesus from friends and uh, you know some about him and you may be going through a similar kind of understanding. Okay, he, he was a good teacher and if you think that, that's fine. It's not enough, but it's a fine start. And you be like this woman and get to know him more and more and more, and you find out there's always more to learn and find out that he is indeed everything that you would need for a savior for whoever you are. Well, this woman found that satisfaction, and she went to the men of the city and said something interesting. Uh, in verse 29, at the end, she says, could this be the Christ? Now, the wording there seems to indicate that she may have some doubts. I prefer 
to think that since it says she left her water pot, she had found the greater satisfaction, and now she is wording her introduction in the best possible way to the men of the city. She doesn't come in as the authority, right? Christ has made me a beautiful saint. You, you think that would draw as much interest from the men of the city than what she said? What did she say in the beginning of verse 29? Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Couldn't be the Christ, could it? I mean, I mean, maybe. Men said, you got me interested. <laughs> you got me interested. I'll come find out. And you know, some of these men, they, they, were, they were pretty good. I mean, they, they let her know that, uh, I, I mean, in, in terms of what we read in verse 39, it says that they believe because of what she said. But there were others who believed only when they found the Lord Jesus. And I don't know if these were rude folks or what, but, you know, the wording that they used, like they wanted her to know. Look at verse 42. He said, now we believe, and they, they point out, not because of what you said, but for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Do you think she felt slighted? I don't think so. I don't think so. She had found the lasting satisfaction. And it didn't matter to her that she put herself down and she said, come see a man who told me all things I ever did with her background. And it didn't matter as long as they came to the Lord. And I want to tell you, if you're here and, and you've had a friend that's been talking to you about the Lord, I can pretty much guarantee that, that they, don't, they don't care whether you think highly of them or not. They just want to see you get to the Lord. They just want to see you get to the Lord. And that's what this woman did. She just said, come see a man. Come see him. And you'll find all your needs met. <laughs> and they did. And they did. They found him to be the savior of the world. Now, this woman and her private conversation with the Lord Jesus. Now, the scripture would go on to point out that there was nobody there. The disciples had gone away and so on. You know, if you came to the Bible and you know that the Lord has lots of conversations in the Bible and does lots of things in the Bible, you would probably guess that there would be lots of private conversations that the Lord has that are recorded in the Bible you might be shocked to find out that's not true. What we have read tonight is one of the very rare times that we have recorded a private conversation between the Lord Jesus and a single individual. Almost always there are other people there. There are the disciples there or, or some group. It's extremely rare that he talks to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, at least of what is recorded for us in the Bible. And this is one of them, and it is rather extended time. Before the Lord's resurrection, I think you could probably count on one hand the number of times you can find a private conversation, the Lord and one person. This is one of them. The another one of these so happens to occur in John 3, the chapter right next to it. And these two, John 3 and John 4, are the longest two private conversations the Lord would have recorded for us in the Bible. And they're put right next to each other. The Lord may be trying to tell us something. These two chapters are meant to be seen together, and we'll just look at that for a moment because it tells us something else about salvation. You see, in John chapter 3, the Lord met a man who was the exact opposite of this woman. Let's look at it quickly. 
one chapter back, we're just going to read the very beginning of John 3 to see this. John 3 begins, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. These two private conversations put side by side could not be with more different people. Let's think about this for a minute. You know, this man, Nicodemus, in John 3, first thing is we get his name, Nicodemus. This woman in John 4, no name. Uh, the character in John 3 is a man, for whatever that's worth. She's a woman, John 4. The man in John 3 is part of the Jewish elite. This woman, a Samaritan, and they were looked down on, and we even get that in what we read. Nicodemus, a religious do-gooder. He was something. She was a religious outcast. You know, Nicodemus would be the kind of guy that people would, mothers would tap their sons and say, you grow up to be like him. Maybe they'd tap their daughters and say, you get with somebody like him. He, he was the kind of person people wanted to be. Uh, he comes to Jesus, in, in, interestingly, and the Lord Jesus is the one who starts the conversation with the woman. And probably one of the biggest contrasts between the two is when they came to, know the, to, to, to talk with the Lord. Nicodemus, it says, comes by night, and this woman comes in the middle of the day. So Nicodemus has everything going for him religiously. He's a Jew, he's a Pharisee, he's no doubt a, a, a religious do-gooder, he is esteemed, he has everything going for him. The opposite is true of this woman. Now, it turns out, when we finish reading the book of John, we will, we will know that Nicodemus got saved. Now, he's not saved here in John 3 when he comes to the Lord. He is saved by the end of the book. We know that. Now, when he got saved, we're not really sure. It could have even been the night that he talked with the Lord Jesus, but, but we're not positive. Now, but I want to ask, since Nicodemus does eventually get saved, and we know the woman gets saved, they both find the Savior, I want to ask you, though, when they started their conversation with the Lord, who was closer to being saved? When they started their conversation with the Lord, who was closer to being saved? Was it Nicodemus or was it the woman? Now, somebody might say, well, ne neither one was close to being saved. You're either saved or you're not, and that's that. So if you're not saved, you're just as far. I think I get that. But I'm, I'm going for something in particular, and I'd like to suggest that the woman was closer to being saved than Nicodemus was, even though they both eventually got saved. And the reason for this, part of it comes through this symbolism that she came in the middle of the day and he came at night. Now, both Nicodemus and this woman were sinners. We know this because the Bible makes it clear that all of us are sinners. They were both sinners. But who do you think had a greater realization that they themselves were a sinner. She did. And I think this is borne out by the fact that she met the Lord out in the sun, out in the middle of the day. In other words, everything was open. Nothing was hidden. Her life was an open book. Everybody that knew her knew her history. She didn't have anything to hide and wasn't hiding anything. She tries a little bit. She says, well, I don't have a husband, but that becomes clear right away. Nicodemus came at night, perhaps indicating uh, more concealment. Nicodemus had two things to learn. 
she had one thing to learn. Nicodemus had to learn that he was a sinner and to trust the Savior. She knew she was a sinner and just had to trust the Savior. In that sense, she was closer to being saved than he was. So that in order to be saved, you have to do two things. You have to agree with God about the problem and agree with God about the solution. You have to agree with God about the problem, and the problem is my sins are bad enough to keep me out of heaven for eternity. My sins are bad enough to suffer the wrath of God in a place that the Bible calls the lake of fire. We, we agree with God about the problem, and then we agree with God about the solution. That's, the solution is his son. Of course, we don't just mentally agree with it. We agree with it in the sense that we receive him and we believe on him for our salvation. Agree with God about the problem, agree with God about the solution. In that sense, the woman is closer to being saved than Nicodemus was. And I don't know where you are tonight. You might be in a situation like Nicodemus where you have both steps to accomplish. Or you might be in a situation like that woman where understanding your own sin is clear enough. And if that's the situation you're in, you might kind of be feeling down. But it's good news because you're one step closer to being saved. The Lord in another place said, I did not call the righteous, but I've called sinners to repentance. And, and what he meant by that was since everybody's sinners, it, it might not make sense. But what he's saying is if you're in a spot where you don't see yourself as a sinner, you're not the kind of person I came to save. You need to get yourself into the position to see yourself as a sinner. That's the kind of person I came to save. If a cure for cancer was found today and it was made available, who would get that cure? Who would go and, and sign up for that, assuming they had the money to pay for it? Who would pay for that and get that treatment? You may say everyone who has cancer would get it. And that's not true. The answer is everyone who knows they have cancer would get it. You could have cancer and not know it, in which case you wouldn't avail yourself of the cure. The same is true for salvation. It is the sinners that go for salvation, not the ones who don't realize that. Nicodemus had both of these to learn the woman only had one of them. So whatever state we're in, may we look at ourselves before God, understand our need, and go to him for salvation. Our Father, we thank you that you have met this satisfaction that this woman was looking for. We thank you that you and your kindness uh, were the answer to what she sought. Uh, we know that there have been people in life who could really identify with her, who've been looking for satisfaction all around the next corner, and every time they think they found it, find out the satisfaction runs out. We thank you that the Lord Jesus, the satisfaction he gives is different. It's a lasting relationship. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He sees us all the way home to glory in heaven, and then the satisfaction continues there. We thank you for him in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.